Welcome everyone to the Ocean Science Meeting 2020. Before I start, I have an announcement. I would like to remind everyone to please stay healthy during the course of the conference and thereafter we want to see you again next time. The World Health Organization has many great tips on its website, which include minimizing handshakes, sorry, and washing hands frequently. And please note that we also have hand sanitizer stations at all main entrances. So now I can start. I am Alessandra Conversi, a senior researcher at the Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche, the Italian National Research Council of, it, uh, of Italy in Lerici. It is a great honor for me to be here as co-chair of one of the largest conventions of ocean science in the world. In my role as co-chair for the Association for the Science of Limnology and Oceanography, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. I would also like to acknowledge my fellow co-chairs, the American Geophysical Union co-chair, Margie Friedrichs. Can you stand up? Can she have the light? <laughs> and Kristen Buck from the University of South Florida. Kristen? And the three of us would like to acknowledge all the efforts of Ocean Science 2020 Program Committee, who have put together what we think is an an excellent program for all of you to enjoy. Program committee people, could you all stand up, please? Everybody who is here, <laughs> the vice chair and everybody. And we also want to thank the three societies that have made this meeting possible, and in particular, the people who helped this to happen and work with us for two years. Heather Nally from AGU, can you stand up? <laughs> and all the AGU team, and Helen Schneider Lame from Oslo. If you are here, stand up. And Jennifer Ramorai of TOS. Thanks everyone for this work. The oceans have sustained human civilization for thousands of years, but human activities and expanding populations are, are posing now enormous problems, both for the planet's oceans and for human lives, ranging from unprecedented biodiversity loss and species extinctions to marine pollution to global change. But you are all very familiar with this, and I do not want to start this conference with a tone of pessimism, because though we must face these environmental threats head on, we cannot really progress without hope and optimism, particularly as we now are approaching the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which is set to launch next year in 2021. With that in mind, the theme for this year's meeting, For a Resilient Planet, is particularly fitting. In fact, as we move towards uncharted scenarios of global challenges, it is resilience that keeps our physical, biological, and social system from crossing potentially catastrophic thresholds. The scientific community is uniquely poised to clear a path towards a more resilient planet. This meeting's theme illustrates the vital, urgent work of scientists in partnership with government and communities to provide the information and to identify the solution for fostering healthier and more resilient oceans, ensuring a safer and more sustainable food supply and mitigating the impacts of climate change. And yet we need to expand our communication skills and to reach the heart of people. Today's inspirational speakers 
knows a lot about engaging communities and leaders in order to give them a greater appreciation of the importance of ocean resources. Nainoa Thompson is a poor navigator as well as the president of a Polynesian Voyaging Society, a non-profit research and educational organization. His work has led to renewed understanding and revival of a traditional navigating, navigating art that had been lost for centuries. Nainoa completed a four-year voyage around the world on the Hokulea, a, a traditional double hull canoe. He's the first native Hawaiian in 600 years to practice this ancient Polynesian art of navigation without the aid of modern instruments, using a profound knowledge of ocean swell, coastal birds' habits, and the position of the sun and the stars. Polynesian navigation embodies the oneness of self and the environment. It requires malama, which is a Hawaiian word to mean caretaking of a canoe and of the available resources. And it is a model for caring of a planet. Through his travels, Naino and his crew have engaged with thousands of people, including world leaders, to highlight the importance of ocean resources, cultural legacies, and their future protection. Nainoa is the recipient of numerous impressive community awards, including the Unsung Hero of Compassion, awarded to him in 2001 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama on behalf of the organization Wisdom in Action. The Educator of the Year Award by the Native Hawaiian Education Association, Mano Mano Ka Ike, which means depth and breadth of knowledge. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award. The National Geographic Society's Hubbard Medal, the Explorer Club's Medal. He currently serves as a member of Ocean Elders and is now planning Hokuleha next voyage, which will be a circumnavigation of the Pacific Ocean. Many of us here in this audience joined the field oceanography with the dream of getting to know the sea, not just in terms of its components and processes, but also in terms of understanding its inner harmony. Today's speaker will share with us his profound knowledge of the ocean, perhaps different from the one we are used to. Scientists and dreamers, please join me in welcoming Nainoa Thompson. This is probably the biggest room I've ever been in my life. Um, <laughs> so I'm very honored to be here, but really quite intimidated. Um, I'm not much of a public speaker. Um, all I have is a story of um, your theme, the oceans. Um, but it's a story of my teachers. And um, so thank you uh, for your time. To let me share with you. I'm not, you got a nice shirt on. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a scientist, so I'm going to struggle with maybe being connected to you, but um, I'm really focused on the importance of bridging science to education. So I'll just get started. I have a lot of slides, and I know you have little time. The oceans, that's where I come from, um, the Pacific. Next. Born and raised on these islands. Miracles in the sea. Hawaiian Islands. Um, the most diverse ecological system, living system in the world, and now nicknamed the extinction capital of the world. Because we don't know how to live there and to protect what matters. Um, <clears throat> But this story is around the last 45 years of my life. Uh, next slide. And it begins with uh, where did we come from? 
where do the Hawaiian people come from? In the middle of the ocean. Um, some would say that the ocean is what divides us, that separates us. Uh, no, not from the voyaging cultural point of view. It's what connects us. And so the story goes like this. We are guessing between two to 3,000 years ago, there was probably the longest sea road traveled in human history in that time. Probably came from islands in the south, we don't know because we forgot. Uh, around the Tahiti area, the Marquesas area, and they would have the first footprint on Hawaiian soil. And um, we don't know the name of the canoe or the captain or the navigators because we forgot. We also know, next slide, <clears throat> But there are remnants of information, pieces of data. One of the really interesting recordings of, of this place in Hawaii was when the first Europeans would come to Hawaii. In 1778, Captain Cook would land and um, he would write that how do you account for these people with the same language, same culture, so spread across the largest nation on earth. But he would also write that these people, um, were 100% fully sustainable. Uh, and the way that they defined wealth was by the protection of fresh water. And those, they had extraordinary systems of growing foods. Back then, people could only live on 17% of the land. The 83% of, of that land would be left to the gods. And it was up in the uplands, the watersheds to protect water. James Cook also placed Lieutenant Bly, who would eventually be Captain Bly, on the bounty onto the southern tip of the island of Hawaii. We believe, well, that's the record of the first European to step on shore. His job is to do a census. And the census is a debatable issue over the years. Anywhere from 400,000 to 1.2 million uh, Native Hawaiians, fully sustainable, nearly the population today. And yet, 90% of our, our energy comes from elsewhere, 85% of our foods come from elsewhere. We're far from sustainable. And yet, we're so intelligent. So if you take this, next slide. But then change happened. Take an average guess of 800,000 Native Hawaiians back then. In the next 28 years after Captain Cook's arrival, 75% would die from introduced diseases that they were not resistant to. And then you f fast forward maybe 100 years ago, and the census was down to the guess that 22,000 Native Hawaiians were left. That meant only one out of 37 would survive. It's a rough story. 1924 would be the first generation in my family. When my father was born, his parents that are nearly pure Hawaiian, who spoke Hawaiian beautifully, practiced their culture, and knew their genealogy, would choose. It's a choice, not to teach your children to remember who they were. Because in the society, not that it was irrelevant anymore, but I believe my grandparents chose not to teach my father language and culture because if he, if he tried to live that life, he would get hurt. 1926, the um, public schools by policy would outlaw, outlaw by policy, language and culture cannot be spoken or practiced in schools. Private schools, and I know so my grandmother would tell me in these stories that that teachers in private schools had the authority to beat you if you tried to speak your language, try to remember your genealogy. The black road of extinction is being well paved in Hawaii. Um, I believe that we were right on the edge of the cliff because I know so when I graduated from high school being taught nothing about who I am, where do I come from, and knowing that I'm should have been taught that I come from the greatest navigators and explorers on the face of the earth in their time. The black road of extinction is well paved. Uh, next slide. 
except miracle. And I was, I'm just the spokesperson for extraordinary teachers and mentors and pioneers and those that took us by the hand and showed us the way. But the story of Hokulea, Star of Gladness, the first voyaging canoe that would be constructed in modern time in Polynesia, a deep sea voyaging canoe, really came from this individual a long time ago, 1958. He was from Santa Barbara. He was a surfer and an anthropologist. Went to Hawaii to do his postdoctorate work. And he went to the University of Hawaii, and a woman confronted him there. His name is Dr. Ben Finney. Her name was um, Catherine Luamala. She was a professor in the University of Hawaii system. And you could count all of those women professors on one hand. And she gave him two books. And she said, read these two books. They're wrong. Change it. One was Kantiki, that Polynesians came from the Americas, drifted around on balsa rafts. Wrong. Um, and then there was the other one by Andrew Sharp, a, a world-renowned anthropologist, who said, oh, no, no, they had voyaging canoes, but they didn't have the intelligence to, to navigate more than 100 miles. So how do you explain the arrival in Hawaii? 2,400 miles away. Mathematically impossible by wind and current to drift there. <clears throat> ben took the book and he read the book and he waited 10 years to take his kind of generating this dream of changing history, putting back truth and dignity into a seafaring culture, an ocean culture. So in 1968, he makes a phone call, next slide, to this man, Herb Kawainui Kane, Hawaiian, born and raised in the valley of Waipio on the island of Hawaii, painter, sculptor, historian, author. And he was a dreamer. And he would paint on these canvas what he saw the history to look like so we don't forget anymore. But it started much with Captain Cook. So Ben calls Herb. He didn't call, Herb was in Chicago. Why didn't he call Hawaii? Because if someone answered the phone, he had no idea what Ben was talking about. And, uh, but Herb did. Next slide. And they would start to be new cartographers to change how we see the world by changing maps. Polynesian Triangle, Hawaii in the north. Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand in the southwest, Rapa Nui, Easter Island in the east, 10 million square miles, bigger than Russia, largest country on the earth, seafaring people, exclude the landmass of Aotearoa and add up all the total square miles of all the rest of the islands. It's 600 times more water than it is land, and it's three times bigger than the continental United States, and you can fit all that land to one-third the state of New York. These are ocean people discovered all these islands way before Captain Cook. Remapping history, how we see the world. Next slide. And then they would take vision, they would take dream, they would choose to act on it and build the vehicle, the first one, in 600 years. We call it Hokulea, star of gladness, named after the star Arcturus, that is the zenith star of Hawaii which the thinking back then, that's how you navigated from Tahiti to Hawaii. I was there, a uh, rough time. Um, I was young. Um, I was just kind of hanging in the shadow of these heroes uh, and these visionaries. And it was, a, it was a confusing time. There were those that would come and pray for this canoe, for its success. There'd be those that would simply didn't care because it's Hawaiian. There's no value, so why care about it? And there would be those that I believe feared this canoe if it found Tahiti, because it might just change everything. I was there, true story. Um, we launched it. I was shocked that we got it in the water. I was shocked that it even floated. The next day, we, 35, of us were on the, 35 of us were on the canoe. This is the true story, by the way. We sail off into, this is the sacred beach of Kualoa on the northern end of Kaneohe Bay on the island of Oahu. 
we sail off, break the two steering sweeps. We don't know what a sheet line is or how to tie it to something, so we just make as many half hitches so it doesn't fall off, and then we're full sail, no sweeps, crash onto the ramp, uh, we go aground on a, a sandbar. The captain says, okay, everybody get off the canoe, because we're stuck on the sand. So we all jump off, true story, and the canoe lines up, and so it was full sail, and, and the captain sailing by himself. And I'm going, wow, this is going to be a rough one. Um, and I was young, and uh, I wanted to go, but I was scared, very scared. Uh, next slide. Problem. Herb Connie would research all of Polynesia, Pol the big triangle, um, for, the, for the traditional Polynesian navigators. And in all this research, he came up with one name, Te Bake, this man on the island of Santa Cruz, essentially in Melanesia, but these are Polynesian outliers. <clears throat> he was the last. Herb sends a team down to talk to this, this elderly man about navigating the canoe he's never seen, across oceans he's never been, with a crew that wasn't selected. And um, Tebaki essentially would tell the group, well, we'll see because elders don't make commitments they don't keep. And the group went home. Herb would receive a letter about six months later from Tebaki's granddaughter that said Tebaki got up one day, said goodbye to the whole family, went into the canoe house, took a small sailing canoe out to sea by himself, and, and he didn't come back. We know what extinction smells like. It's the end. It's over. You have no one to reach to to help you find your way. Another miracle. Next slide. This is the name you need to remember. The Star Man. He's from the small islands of Micronesia. Small island called Satawal in the Western Carolines. By miracle, the leadership, after they've recognized there's no navigators, was choosing to say, well, we'll just navigate it to Tahiti ourselves and having no idea how much they don't know. And that ignorance, how dangerous that is. By miracle, there was a Peace Corps worker by the name of Mike McCoy who worked on an island called Satawal. By miracle, he was joined the leadership meeting and said, hey, if you want a navigator, he's five miles down the road. He's living on the Thompson Cromwell sh uh, UH research ship, University of Hawaii research ship, and he's teaching scientists how to catch tuna with traditional lures. Go talk to him. His name is P.I. Luke. And he's the master. He's the best. In Micronesia, with cultural disintegration, giving up the stars for the compass and um, the sail for the outboard, that there were six masters left in Micronesia, therefore on the earth, and Mao was the youngest. He is the edge of extinction. He is the cliff. <clears throat> Mao would be approached, and I wasn't there. I'm just not in leadership. <clears throat> but I heard the story that they said, hey, Mao, will you come and help us? Um, will you sail a canoe that's not constructed yet? And will you travel on a voyage that's six times longer than anyone you ever took? And uh, a canoe that's eight times bigger? And then will you cross the equator, lose your key steering stars, like the North Star? and find stars you've never seen before? And will you sail with a crew that wasn't selected? And I heard, in limited inches, uh, English, he said yes. The obvious is Mao is courageous. He's a navigator, he's master. And uh, Mao is actually his nickname. Pius is his real name. Mao is the nickname. It means to be fierce and courageous. 
But many, I think that Mao would make that choice just knowing him. He's one of the most compassionate people I met, that he knew that this voyage was important to indigenous people. He knew he don't come. He ain't gonna make it. Next slide. That's his island called Satawa, Western Carolinas. It's a mile and a quarter long, about a half mile wide, no lagoon. So the Spanish and the Germans and the Japanese and the Americans had no interest because there was no military value. So they didn't occupy. So the navigation stayed alive. And um, this is our school. This is the most powerful school of traditional navigation in the world because it's from the school called Woryang. Woryang is the highest of magic. And Mao is the youngest master left on the planet. <clears throat> Next slide. So it's a map. Um, Hawaii is on the kind of upper left and Tahiti is down on the bottom. Next. This is the line, Mao. You just follow the line and you hit the island. Um, do you know that this voyage they took would be longer than a voyage from, you went direct from S San Diego to Boston. It's far. Open ocean. Two biggest wind systems in the world are consistent northeast trade winds, southeast trade winds. Collide on the equator, you have high evaporation rate with direct sunlight, cloudiest and rainiest place on Earth. And you're navigating just by nature. Stars, sun, moon, planets, wave, wind, bird. Everything is in nature. The question is, can you see it? Can you feel it? If you're trying to contemplate from Waikiki Beach, trying to imagine looking at Tahiti, look to the, make a, a, an angle from the west side of, of Tahiti to the east side, it's less than one angle, one, one degree. And just steer there by nature. And that blue line is our road. This is our road. It's called Kiala i Kahiki, pathway to and from Tahiti. Our ancestors went back and forth along this road. It's our cultural heritage. It's our road. And Mao is going to get, give it back to us. Next slide. This is Hokulea, old slide. Three days out after she left Honolulu Bay, Maui, May 1st, 1976. 17 on board. And Mao was the leader. Next slide. Arrival, Papaete, Tahiti. 17,000 Tahitians. I was there. I flew down on a jet. I was somehow got selected to be on the crew to go back from Tahiti to Hawaii. And um, I had to climb the monkey pod tree to see the canoe in, come in. 17,000 Tahitians. We had to ask the children to please, in English, to please get off the canoe because you're sinking the stern. And um, it was when we came in, the Tahitians maintain their language, their genealogy, and they have their orators that still know the old stories of the voyagers, of the captains, of the navigators, but they don't have the canoe. Hokulea was theirs. Mao brought in the papayete. Everything would change, not immediately, but the story would get out through the biggest nation on earth. What it started to do, it started to take this kind of very negative economic and health and education statistics that Native Hawaiians are the worst in their homeland, that Native Hawaiians are going to be more destined to fail more than, than to succeed. It's our story. When we knew that Mao allowed us to believe and to dream that we come from great navigators, then you see bumper stickers, you see t-shirts, you hear language. And, it, and, uh, and it's the birth of the beginning of Renaissance. They call it the Hawaiian Renaissance. Uh, next slide. And then Mao, second miracle, he'd come back for 30 years before he died to teach us. Take us by the hand like children pull us through a window of time into the old ocean of the old story and keep pulling us and keep pulling us and showing us the way. 30 years he came. Next slide. And he would make us, remind us constantly, don't 
call this a canoe. Call it your school. Your school of nature, of ocean nature. It is what takes you to where you want to go. You don't sail to islands, you bring the island to you. If you can call it through nature. Next slide. And don't talk about the word crew. It doesn't make sense to him. Everything that we, he taught us in the way that we sail this canoe, it wasn't about how good you could steer or, 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 or how strong you were. It was how kind were you to each other. That on the canoe, you are navigating by good family values. You take care of everyone. Everybody comes home. No one gets hurt. There's no victims on the canoe. Next slide. And he would let us go. Showed us the way. Stay with us. He would come, because I asked him, back to Hawaii and lived at my parents' house to train me for 28 months. Never went home once. Stayed with us. Next slide. And allowed us to chase our dreams. 1980, we would sail from Hawaii to Tahiti and back, and, um, and he'd be on board. Make sure we didn't make big mistakes. It, we had, you had people from Hawaii and elsewhere who would be captaining and navigating his canoe. He gave us the road back. Next slide. And then we would sail about 13 different voyages around the Pacific. So we went as far north as Alaska, far south as Aotearoa, as far East as actually here, the west coast of the United States, and then as far west as Japan, but only in the Pacific, about 200,000 miles of sailing um, over all those days. Next slide. But in that period of the continuous sailing, it would take for Renaissance to take hold within a society, it would take a decade, a decade of change. The first change came in in education. That 10 years, 1985, that would be nine years since the first voyage, it was estimated that there were only, there were less than 100 fluent native wine speakers. Today, there's 22,000. Because schools changed. Wine language became first language. Culture being core, a core graduate competency. And that immersion schools would be, would be created, Hawaiian-based cultural schools would be created in the charter school systems. It started to change, but it would change everything. It would change policy by legislature. It would change law. You can't today dredge a coral reef and take the coral and fill a Hawaiian fish pond, build beautiful big homes as, by creating an oceanfront and gate the community. You can't do that anymore. You can't destroy streams, you can't destroy coral reefs. The list goes on and on. But what it also did, it changed business. Because the economic model needed to keep up with the pride and dignity of what it is to be Hawaiian. It changed the identity of Hawaii. It was the Renaissance. Next slide. The second Renaissance. This is the other name. I would, if you want to remember, it would be this other one, the, the other star man, inspired. This photograph was by astronaut William Anders, 1968, Apollo 8, when they would go around the backside of the moon and see the first Earth rise, which many consider that was the moment that, that the global environmental movement was born. This man would be seeing this island in space and would be inspired. Next slide. <clears throat> he's a uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Beach. He's Keikioko Aina, he's Ku Aina. He stands on our land. He's born from our land. He, he's from Hawaii. Second astronaut from Hawaii into space. And um, he was uh, graduated from high school, went into the Air Force, flew to Vietnam, and then was, one of the, was a lead pilot in the Thunderbirds, the, the best pilots in the world. And then he would become 
recruited into the astronaut program. And um, my best friend, teacher, mentor, you need to be less afraid. I mean, go more, and I know he'd push me. I met Lacey. He was my hero. He didn't know me. I knew him. We have a place called the Waikiki Shell. Maybe some of you guys will be there. It's this big amphitheater. It's kind of like this room, giant. And the high school he graduated from was honoring all these really awesome alumni. And they get up on the podium, and they start telling everybody how good they are. And then Lacey was, was a keynote and last, and, and I wanted just to see him. He was my hero. So true story. They have a, like a chain link fence around it, high security. I jump over the fence as I didn't want to go pay to see him. And then um, I went in the back of the, that shell with all the curtains are on the side, and I the back door was open, I went right inside, stood by the curtains, like I worked there or something, and nobody ever asked me a question. And uh, Lacey arrives in a, in a, um, a five-door white limousine. Um, I just wanted to see him. And, um, he gets out in a white tuxedo, black bow tie, type A, fighter pilot. And he walks right by me. Uh, I, but I didn't touch him or anything, but he went up on the, on the stage and he, he showed uh, his flight in Colombia, his first one. And um, standing ovation, went right by me when he went out, jumped in the limousine, was gone. I thought I'd never see him again. True story, that was a Friday night. Saturday morning, I get a phone call from the governor's office. Nobody in the governor's office even knows who I am, let alone call me. 6.30 in the morning. And he tells me, Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Beach wants to sail with you today because we're training. From the go on a voyage to the Pacific Arts Festival in Rarotonga, Cook Islands in October 1992. And I tell him, okay. But I was smart enough to tell him, hey, you know, tell him come down to where the canoe is. It's an old, dilapidated, old pineapple shed that was abandoned. That's, that's not Houston, by the way. That's where Hokulea is. And um, we told him, come down at 9 o'clock. Knowing that the crew was coming down at 8 o'clock, and my crew, our crew, is just kind of regular people. They're not astronauts. And so I get down there, and I tell him, hey, you guys get together. My hero's coming down today. You guys got to really, really work hard. Can you put something on your feet, put a T-shirt on, and then, can you speak the best English you can find? And, 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 uh, and he's like, oh, okay, no, no, whatever. Well, well, we can handle that. And so Lacey shows up at 9 in his mother's rusted DeSoto. Do you even know what a DeSoto is? And uh, gets out of the car. No shirt. <laughs> Wearing slippers and his shorts are ripped, and uh, he gets on the canoe, and he's so amazing that everybody's intimidated. It's that kind of very uncomfortable, quiet moment when you don't know what to say. And um, so he's just kind of looking at us, and then he goes to the rail of the canoe, and he starts rubbing the canoe. He keeps rubbing Hokulea, and he goes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me stay with you today, because today I'm going to understand what the, what the real power of exploration really is. And I stepped back and said, this guy is going to be best friend. And we did some pretty wild stuff together, because he's kind of crazy, but um, next slide. <laughs> he loved Hokulea. He would call it spaceship of our ancestors. It's where we, it's where we come from, learning how to explore. Next slide. By chance, he's flying um, in the shuttle the same time that we're coming back from Rarotonga. It's on the schedule. Uh, next slide. I'm going to go quick. It's going to take a long time. So he conjures up, steals his radio out of, the, out of his fighter in Ellington Field, gets some engineer to hook it up illegally, and then he, he, create, he gets the education committee to agree to talk to the voyagers. And so we are 
sailing back from Rarotonga at four miles an hour, he's going around the earth in 90 minutes, traveling six miles per second. And we have six minutes for the antennas to see each other. We called Honolulu. We couldn't catch it because our system's a single sideband. It's a very archaic system. There's no, by the way, there's no satellite phones back there. And, um, and so anyway, we called Rarotonga. We hooked it up. And next slide. And then he would talk just to 35,000 school kids in Hawaii. And, uh, and I still see those children that, that tell me how inspired and how it navigated their lives because of him. Next slide. Ocean Man. He goes, you know, I know I have a, a present from you. And um, I'll bring it from space. This is the cockpit window of his second flight in Colombia. That's at the edge of the earth on the top. At the bottom of the window, you see the island of Hawaii, Moko, Hawaii. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little red spot in the clouds. It's called Kianaka Koi. On the slopes of Mauna Kea, at 12,500 foot elevation, is where there once 35,000 years ago was an eruption, and it was a glacier that covered the whole mountain, super cold the lava, and created the best stone next to the greenstone in New Zealand to, to make an ads to build canoes. That thing floating in the cockpit window was given to Lacey by his grandfather came from Kianaka Koi. And uh, Lacey smuggles it on board, <laughs> takes the photograph, and basically saying he was concerned about the island we call Earth. He was concerned that we're making big mistakes in terms of our relationship to the island. And so he was the one that starts to get me pulled into that concern. And then he goes, I know, but I got the answer. The ads represents looking 500 years back into the ability to sustain ourselves on islands, looking at the, le the survival legacy of islanders and Hawaii. Then he said the cockpit window represents the power of technology, and he said we need to mesh things together, but it needs to be navigated by good human values. What is going to navigate technology? He didn't believe it. He was just hoping. Next slide. Once a year, I'm sorry, twice a year, we would go. And we would cross on our calendar books one day. That day is kapu. Nobody touched that day. I'll meet you in Hilo on the island of Hawaii. Rent a car illegally, drive it up to Mauna Loa, onto the black lava, where it absorbs all light, bring stars close, dream. And our job was to figure out how can we bring together Hokulea and the shuttle program and inspire children to explore and to discover, find solutions, change the world. I was following him. I didn't understand it, but I knew he was correct. Next slide. But the conversation would always go back to the island. He would get so furious and angry about what we're doing to the earth. And he'd become physical. I'd have to hug him. I'm a small guy. He's a big guy. In the black lava, I gotta hug him to settle him down. But that rage he had, how, how can we do this to the only island we have? And he was really interesting. He thought space exploration was really kind of cool. But he said, the reason why I go out to space is so I can turn around and look at the Earth and help us make better decisions. The rage was real. Next slide. Kind of long story, but his next flight in shuttle, his mission special partner, um, Captain Bill Shepard, who would be um, the um, first commander in the International Space Station was fully operational in the year 2000, was a mission specialist with Lacey on this flight. Bill Shepard saw the inertia navigation system that the Hawaiian Islands are going to come up in the shuttle dawn, the light of the dawn. Lacey's sleeping. Bill scrapes him off the wall with his Velcro stuck on a wall, floats him to the cockpit window. 
relationship doesn't tell me the story, but Bill does. He goes, yeah, I pulled his goggles off. He kind of clears his eyes. He sees the Hawaiian Islands in the yellow dawn of the shuttle dawn. And Lacey goes, that's it. That's the answer. It's about living on islands. He said, if Hawaii wants to be fully sustainable, we have the science, we have the technology, we can do that, but it's a matter of culture. That's navigated and defined by values. But he said, Nainoa, this is the place. It needs to be the laboratory and the microcosm of figuring out solutions. And then it needs to be the school. So it was science and education being blended. Next slide. Then it gets rough. Um, 1993, in the fall, he gets diagnosed. Something's wrong with him, um, losing his balance. And but they finally figure out at NASA he has lymphomelanoma, stage four. And um, this is the urgency of him. And I know you have no idea how beautiful your island is, so you see the whole thing from space. But we're changing it. And it's going to turn around and change us. And we don't know what to do. The urgency was getting more powerful with him. Next slide. Then it gets really rough. Best friend. It'd be September 1995. I get a phone call from his wife, Alice, who's in Houston. She says, you've got to get on a plane today. You gotta come now. I fly to Houston and um, I go into the house. It was late afternoon, it was dimly lit. There was a hundred people in there. Quiet, sad, I didn't know anybody. And I asked Alice, hey, where's Lacey? And um, he's in the bedroom, he's waiting for you. And so I go in the bedroom and he goes, I get in there, he's sitting on a wheelchair, fighter pilot. It's heavy. But he wasn't sad. He was powerful. He was urgent. He was intense. He says, I'm going to get through this, Nainoa, but you need to listen to me today. Listen to me. So I sat with him and he said, Nainoa, you cannot protect what you don't understand. And you won't protect it if you don't care. And you can't do it by yourself. He starts to plant the seed of sailing Hokulea around the world. And then he says, forcibly, promise me three promises. The first one was, listen to the language the new language that nobody knows on earth. Climate change, sustainability, hypoxia, dead zones, turning up the thermostat. The new language that is going to change all of us and we don't know what to do. You need to learn the language. And it comes from this room, by the way. And he said, promise me you'll build a school. You'll build a school on islands to help us figure out how to save the earth. Then he said, you promise me, Naino, that you can't do those things. You can't protect. You can't change unless you, unless you connect. And he said, sail Hokulea around the world. And I told him, okay. Because he knew it wasn't going to be there. Six days later, he would die. Next slide.
We have an organization called Ohana Va'a, Family of the Canoe in Hawaii that has all the leadership at all the islands in Hawaii. We get together once a year and this is not their promise, it's mine. Those leadership. So we would debate, put on the agenda, the amazing inspiration of sailing around the whole world on a, on a sailing canoe that's only three feet off the water. And so we're all excited to go every year until someone says, wow, what about risk? Can someone tell me in this room how dangerous it is? Because we're going to be taking crew members that have children. Nainoa, how dangerous is it? What about the hurricane? Or the pirate? What about the mosquito? What about the violence? What about the rogue wave of South Africa? What about hypothermia in higher latitudes? Tell me, Nainoa, how dangerous is it? And then we would vote, and every single time we'd vote, it'd be 100% no, we're not going. And this is where I thank this room. Because you made the language louder. 13 years we would vote no. Until the 14th year. We got together, the language is loud. The question is not whether we should go or not. The question before that group was, what's more dangerous? The hurricane? The rogue wave? The mosquito? The pirate? Or, you understand the language and you're staying tied to the dock. What's more dangerous? We voted four times. It was unanimous four times. Because if we're not united, we will destroy ourselves. And then we set off on a voyage we didn't know how to do. Next slide. But it began with taking care of your home at sea. Six years we trained. It took 18 months to restore Hokulea. It took 32,000 volunteer man hours to get the canoe ready. Next slide. I'm going to go fast. We built a second canoe called Hiki Analia, the star sister to Hokulea and, uh, in New Zealand. And it's powered by the sun, electric engines and sail to be our escort boat. Um, it was only successful half of the voyage because we didn't have enough technology and solar power to tow Hokulea out of harm. Next slide. And we would train. We had many people. Diversity mattered. Inclusion mattered. So we had people from around the world going to be the crew. The crew, we needed 322 crew members to sail around the world on 34 different crew changes. Next slide. And we trained the young. It is the most crucial issue today, is preparing the young for tomorrow, a future that we're not clear what it's going to be. We trained them, and they came, um, young navigators, young captains. Next slide. It's a sail plan. It was um, 37 months, um, 41,000 miles, 327 ports. And we were learning. We were connecting, and we were trying to find what Lacey was looking for. Is humanity kind enough to change? Next slide. And we left. We went south first, next. Navigating 50% of the time in this voyage, we navigated the traditional way. 50% we had used modern instruments because it was too dangerous. Next slide. Went to Tahiti for permission. Next slide. We'd go to Samoa, and we would take on the canoe the United Nations Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, next slide. He would write in a bottle a personal note that his 127 countries affiliated with the oceans, well, he will work to um, make them, protect it. Next slide. <clears throat> we would go to Aotearoa, next slide. We would go to a place called, a school called Manaya Kalani, 13 clusters of schools of the poorest children in New Zealand. That the vision is they borrowed our star lines, named the school Manaya Kalani, and taught them navigation culturally, and then they had science and technology was the other half of their education, linking them two together. 
So these children know how to voyage. They can go anywhere in the world, but they know how to come home because they know who they are. 2,400 students, poorest students, would come and they would honey hokulea. They would touch her. Next slide. Australia, next slide. Yeah, 176 schools, 120,000 students, 7,400 teachers, where these elementary schools do one thing, protect the oldest and the largest single living ecological system called the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, they take us by the finger, drag us around, and they show us where they're restoring and growing fish and algae. These are elementary school students. They take us to places where, they're, where, where they were um, protecting wounded seabirds and turtles. I mean, it starts to remind me of what is the purpose of schools and what would happen to the world if we changed it. Next slide. Yep, we went to some pretty awesome places. Yep, next slide. Yeah. That was a good day, bad day. <clears throat> but here, where we dove, and this slide is 42 sharks, there's probably 400. It's not a long story, but me and my ex friend were diving with tanks and on uh, some sand pit at 60 feet. And he says, I tell him, hey, let's go make. There's a, there was only a few sharks down there, so we'd make a, take one of those plastic bottles they drink water from and fill it with water, go down there, fill it with the air, and then start rubbing that bottle to see, make a noise that they'd never heard and see what happens. All these fish are, you guys call it jacks, we call it ulua, kind of knocking you over. And then he pulls a bottle out of my hand, he's the photographer, and then he says, look up, and all these sharks are coming. So now we're crawling, trying to find the anchor chain, and, and, and um, but the point was, this is what it's supposed to be. But boy, in Hawaii, you'll never find this. Not in the main eight Hawaiian Islands. In the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, you will. Next slide. And then we find the other side. Uh, Indonesia, you can walk on the plastics. Next slide. Africa. I'm going to go quick because you don't have much time. Um, no Panama Canal. Really rough place. Highest incident of road waves. Next slide. It's a 900 mile leg. Took 61 days. It was the shortest leg, longest time because we kept hiding from storms. Next slide. Yeah, it was like. It was pretty wild. Next slide. But the reason why we went to this place called Cape Town was to, to honor a friend that would come and bless Hokulea in 2013, the year before we left. And um, his name was uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who said, if you make it to Cape Town, I'll come see you, but I'm sick, so I don't go in the public anymore. He is the guy that carried 20 million poor children on his back in South Africa, Africans, at the worst of the issues of equity. He would carry them. He's tired. He's sick. But we would come to Cape Town, next slide, and we were there. And his family said he's going to come. But he's not going to speak. He arrives in a van. They build a tent for him. They put a couch in there. He's got all this clothing on. He's got this woolen hat on, and it's really hot. And uh, they lie him down, and they, he says, he, he can't speak. No, no, I'm really sorry. It's okay. He's here. And um, until we brought our children down from Hawaii, charter school kids, private school kids, public school kids, to come and honor Archbishop. So they have all their instruments, but during the speeches, they weren't playing, but an African girl went up to one of our Hawaiian girls and asked her, can I beat your drum? Because the only drum she got is an old cracker can. And, and they, we have the, these Hawaiian drums, and the Hawaiian girl gave her the drum, and she starts beating this drum. Then all the kids are getting up. And then we're facing the other way, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu's daughter says, no, no, you've got to turn around. Next slide. There he was, in the middle of the street, dancing with the children. I knew, at that moment, this voyage was worth it. It was worth it. Next slide, quick. We chose Everglades over Miami. 
because nature came first. Next slide. NASA, next slide. Saw my friend, next slide. New York, next slide. Take back the bottle. 18 commitments from 18 countries to protect the oceans. Gave it to the Secretary General. Next slide. Maine, Nova Scotia, next slide. The farthest north we go to 62 locks over two, two mountain ranges into the Great Lakes in the St. Lawrence Riverway. Uh, next slide. Then the last lock would be Panama. Next slide. Back into the Pacific. Going home. Next slide. Went to this amazing island, the Galapagos. Next slide. 1% for man, 99% for nature, both land and ocean. Next slide. And we're navigating home. Next slide. Rapa Nui. We enter Polynesia. We're home. After three years. Um, next slide. Homecoming. It would be the largest viewed event in Hawaii history. It would be but it was much more millions of viewers from away from Hawaii. It was an exhausting voyage, um, but it mattered. Next slide. And we did what Lacey said, go learn. Find out if humanity really cares enough to really make the change. Does it really care? and build relationships of friends around the world. Next slide. Because ultimately, you need to give it to them. A different sail plan than the one that we've been on. A new sail plan. Next slide. <clears throat> um, there's a navigation class in the Kamehameha schools in Hawaii that have navigators in their training, their high school students. I asked them to do one thing. Go find the center of the Pacific Ocean. Go draw a line from, um, from the Aleutians to Antarctica and from Chile to China. Where is the center? And then go vertical and you, how high do you got to get so you can start to see the borders uh, of, of all the nations. And so they come back and said, yeah, we got the center. Well, how high you got to go? They go 40,000. I told them, no, 40,000 feet. I can see, all I see is water. They go, no, 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 I know. 40,000 miles, the biggest ocean. One half the salt water, one third the surface of the planet. Uh, and what's really interesting, all terrestrial land on the earth fits in there. And uh, this is my home. And my responsibility. And so next slide, quickly, we're going on the next voyage. It's a six year campaign to build bridges like science, humanities, culture, art, all together with a new sail plan. Our job is to share it with the world through educational systems. We're gonna start it in Alaska, go clockwise around the Americas down to South America and Chile, quickly into Oceania, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, New Zealand, Australia, into the island of our teacher, and then end up where the 65% of the world's economy is in the Southeast Asia region. Philippines and China and Taiwan, Okinawa, Japan, um, South Korea, Hokkaido, and then end in Russia. Because the distance from Russia to Japan, counting the uh, Russia and Alaska is less than the Molokai Channel in Hawaii. It's only 19 miles. It's still one people, one ocean. And we have to act that way. Next slide. So it's going to be starting next year, and it's going to go through 2021 to 2025. That'll be Hokulea's 50th anniversary when we come home. And um, I will leave you with the star men, my teachers. 1980, when we completed the voyage to Tahiti and back, where we navigated, Miles packing his bag to go home after 28 months living at my parents' house for the first time, and he sits me down and he goes, okay, now I know it. This is 5,000 miles of voyage, and he goes, you did okay? And, um, and he said, but if you want someone to know everything, send your son, you're too old. My, this is Ma, my grandfather picked me when I was one year old, put me in the tide pool to play. I hear the bird. I touch the wind. 
I smell the ocean. It's about that very important first four years, which science says, where 80% of the brain is developed, it's in that time that you need to be close to your place and to the natural world and to wildlife, if you're ever going to care for it. And then he said, by age five, he's already sailing in the voyaging canoe. He goes, yeah, you're not, not now. When the wave comes, you make the canoe go up and down. When the canoe go up and down, the canoe make me sick, because he's seasick. My grandfather tied my hands and throw me overboard, drag me behind the canoe. And mom, he spoke with such great love for his grandfather. He says, yeah, my grandfather let me go inside the ocean so I can go, next slide, so I can go inside the wave. When I go inside the wave, I become the wave. And when I become the wave, I am navigator. Send your son, you're too old. Mom's gone. I don't know you in this room, but I believe in you. I honor your work, what you stand for, what you fight for. In many ways, you are both the grandfather and the wave at the same time. You allow people to go into the ocean, to go in the wave, and you become the wave. That movement that we need to have information drive decisions. Next slide. And then this man, the other star man. I miss my friend. I'll go to the last slide. Next slide. Next slide. Lacey. Lacey actually sailed with Mao. Not long, but on short trips in Hawaii. And Lacey would sit me down and go, wow, that guy, he's amazing. Because Mao, Lacey would go, okay, I get it, I know. Um, you only know where you are by memorizing where you come from. In other words, you cannot look up at the heavens and have some coordinate mathematical system that says, oh, here, this is where I am on Earth. No. When you leave Hawaii and take 31 days to go to Tahiti, you only know where you are by where you came from. And the only way you can do that is to watch nature. And if you're going to watch nature, guess what? You can't sleep. Mao stays up 22 hours a day, only sleeps in catnaps, watching nature. And Lisa would go, wow, he's making 5,000 observations of the natural world. And then he goes, Wow, he makes like 500 choices per, this is a day, per day. He makes 500 choices about turn left, turn right, sheet in, sheet out, balance that water jug. And he's, he's like an orchestra, 500 choices to make two decisions. Light of dawn, light of dusk, where you decide where are you and where are you going. Then Lacey, the mathematician, would go, and I know we're approaching 8 billion on this earth. Let's just say every human being makes 500 choices a day times 8 billion. That's four, Lacey would tell me, that's four trillion choices human beings will make every day. That's 4,000 billion. Then Lacey would say, what if the choices were good? What if they're good choices? That's why, on behalf of the star men, on behalf of the men and women who sail these canoes, believing that there's a destination that's worth it, that somehow we'll be a part of the movement that will have the second generation and the third generation come with their Earth would be good enough for them. But Mao and Lacey knows at the core, if they were standing in this room and listening to me, they would say, you need to honor this room, Naino. Because we cannot make any of those decisions without the language, without the information, without the data. We cannot. Without that information, without that language, 
We are in the storm with no navigator to get us out. So on behalf of them and the men and women of these canoes, I just want to say thank you. Very honored to be here on behalf of all of my teachers, especially the two starmen. Thank you. like this fantastic talk about cultural values and how they, are, they matter and how, much we, and how they can help to protect our oceans. So now we'd like to invite you all to the icebreakers reception on the west terrace over there. Thank you.